Kara. And we, we were all going to wear these fifth helmets and khaki shorts. And I came out and no one else else, and no one else had bothered. It's just gonna burn up on the banks of the river Nile. Someone had put a fez on, but they were still wearing a suit and a couple of tea towels. the other stage and they were dicks with night runners having thrown their bags and scarves all looking like on the waterfront cool and I remember thinking yeah hang on this has gone a bit far actually what these 1980 tribes had in common from young soul rebels to rude boys to synth futurists was working class roots talks have been going on but there's no sign of any agreement steel industry faces an unhappy Easter. And in contrast to art school middle class punks, their upbringing gave them a different attitude to Top of the Pops. Scargill was at the head of a march in Sheffield to protest against government spending cuts. We're from working class backgrounds and at the time, you know, the political scene and everything, there were some very depressed areas in the UK. <laughs> get the opportunity to go on a program like Top of the Pops, we were all going to take it because it was our way out of, you know, not having to go into, like, the steelworks or a job that your mum and dad have done. And, and you know, that, that's your chance and you're going to grab it. We were definitely a different generation. You know, we didn't hate Top of the Pops. When it was offered to us, we were going to take it with both hands. Ten, nine, eight. And the 8th of May 1980 would prove to be a historic show for fledgling synth pop. Pick up 65. As old gent producer Robin Nash gambled on two records outside the top 50. Nine. Rambo. Handing debuts to both the Human League and OMD. We were in Brussels just finishing the European tour. We got a phone call. We almost didn't make it because this was in the time with no mobile phones obviously. Uh, some guy was come came running out of the hotel as we were pulling out and uh, just waving frantically and we thought, okay, who's not paid the bill? Should we just put our foot down and floor it? And so we stopped and he said, Oh, important vocal from your record label. The song had leapt into the charts at the Giddy Heights at number 54. We flew in. The problem was our equipment was still on the ferry. The next day, I nearly didn't make it because we'd been very kindly allowed to stay on Richard Branson's private barge. Turns out that actually it was being refurbished. And on the day of my first ever Top of the Pops, I was woken up by a 12-inch industrial drill bit coming through the wall above my head. I was almost lobotomized before I made it to the studio. From orchestral maneuvers in the dark, this is going to be a smash. It's called Messages. Because the song was only number 54, the audience didn't know who we were and had never heard the song. Nobody wanted to stand in front of us. Whilst we were standing there, I could hear them going, who are they? I don't know. Have you heard them? No, I haven't. And then there was a couple of people just waving to their mother. OMD 
Dee's machine didn't just rile the MU. Their tape recorder had history. I thought that IMD just, just nicked our stuff. We had been over to Manchester to play at Tony Wilson's club. One of the guys there that helped to set up all the stuff up, he was so interested in what we were doing, trying to get all the details, and he rang us up a few months later and asked for the sort of makes of the, of the tape recorder and things, and that, that I think was OMD's manager at the time. So we felt a little bit like they'd uh, borrowed quite a lot from us. That's how it went, right? You 
before I had a chance to get it off to him, he Elvis passed away. And I thought, oh, that's, that's, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I was played it on the guitar by Ray, and it was sounded more like a country and western song than a than a pop song, which I was used to doing. But when we went into the studio and the track was put down, the rest is history. My heart beats like a drum, and I went on and I had a normal drum. Okay, went on my demo, but by this time the syndrome thing had come around. You see. This is a drum kit, do you believe? And you found if you tweak them, instead of it sounding like a drum or a normal snare, you get this doom, doom sound. Tom, tom. Boo, boo, you know. But for years, I mean, I had people follow me in the street going, boo, boo, you know. <laughs> Before Top of the Pops, we auditioned Tony and Pinky. The boys were very flamboyant. It was such an energetic song. I just thought it would be nice if we had a couple of nice boys either side. But Kelly, Tony and Pinky were never meant to appear on Top of the Pops. The playlist is a selection of 40 records, judged suitable for maximum exposure on the air. The decision at the end of the day is a crucial one for the artists and the record companies. Candidate in at four, oh, equals at 47. Radio One's playlist police made or broke records, and they never gave Kelly Single a chance. And the record company had actually stopped pressing the single when Ray had a chance meeting in a northern club. I gave the record to a DJ, because the DJ said, I really like this, can I keep it? And it started selling, you know, about three records a day. And then it went up to about 20 a day, and then it went on and on and on. It became a kind of gay dance anthem. And then the record company would get an artist, and they were looking at the catalogue, and I'm saying, what is this record, you know? They decided to start repressing it, so the people made that record. Stayed in the charts for 16 weeks. It was nearly the highest selling single of 1980. And I beat the jam. From the west coast of the States, produced by Phil Spector, a sound that's so big it's gonna go massive. It's the Ramones on Baby I Love You!